Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us uh, for today's webinar around dispelling the myths around UK payments. My name is Maya Sanchez, and I'll be your host during this live session. So it's just a little bit of housekeeping this morning. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to go through a couple of items. This webinar is planned to take about 45 minutes, including Q&A. Uh, all participants will be muted throughout session to ensure audio quality. If you do have any questions for our panelists today, please do pop them into a chat box um, throughout the session, and these will be obviously um, asked either throughout the session, if we do have time for those to ask live, uh, or we will address them at the end of the session. And uh, please note that this webinar is being recorded, and that recording will be made available to everyone who's uh, attended this webinar, as well as those that registered and haven't been able to join us today. So uh, look out for the webinar recording after uh, that session. Okay, so today's agenda, uh, we will uh, aim to dispel a couple of key myths around open banking, confirmation of pay, request to pay, as well as new payments architecture. And uh, we will wrap up with a short Q&A towards the end of the session. But as I mentioned, feel free to uh, send your questions throughout the um, webinar, uh, and we will aim to uh, take that question live and, and obviously ask our experts uh, to address those. So speakers, uh, I'd like to introduce everyone today to our uh, very own Danny Doyle, who's our uh, Senior Product Manager at Access Bay. Danny works really closely with Pay UK uh, in helping shaping the um, changing payments landscape in the UK. His main focus is around B2B payments, and uh, he is very much uh, focused on delivering customer-centric fintech solutions. Um, Danny will be joined by two um, special guests today, Rory Edwards and Adrian Bernholt. Uh, Rory, Rory is the um, External Affairs Communications Specialist at Pay UK. His knowledge focuses uh, on political compliance and user engagement that ultimately leads to um, digital transformation of UK payments. He does specialize in the overlay services for the new payments architecture. And our second special guest speaker today, Adrian Berhold, is the Payments Practice Lead and Founding Director of JAM ICT Consultancy. Uh, Adrian specializes in delivering new payment services to the market and has a wide ranging experience in both the nuances of open banking for corporates and a history of working with the new payments architecture. So welcome to all of our speakers. Welcome to our guest speakers. Uh, and I think without a further ado, I will turn to our lead presenter today, Danny Doyle. Danny, take it away. Thank you, Maya. Uh, morning, everyone. Uh, thanks very much for uh, joining us. Um, obviously, we really do appreciate you taking 45 minutes out of your busy schedules to um, listen to myself, Rory and Adrian, talk around some of the changes to UK payments. Hopefully we can give something back by um, dispelling a couple of myths, uh, giving a bit of an educational perspective on what's going on um, in payments. So uh, I guess as a sort of self-professed payments geek, um, it's a really, really exciting time for me uh, and for Access Pay to be in, in payment. So um, first of all, I guess, why, why are we running the um, event? So um, I know that we've got a lot of existing customers and a lot of non-customers. So just a very quick recap of what Access Pay does to kind of frame the discussion. So we um, sell uh, payments and cash management software to businesses. Uh, so we don't sell direct to end consumers. We help corporates connect to banks and we help banks connect to corporates, whether that's for payments, collections or cash and liquidity services. We kind of integrate with the corporate's back office systems to send financial messages. 
Um, so the reason <clears throat> the reason we've um, decided to host this event, and we've done a couple face to face as well, is because there are so many changes in the payments landscape. There is a lot of myth and misinformation. Uh, some companies are really, really excited about the changes and are hoping to seize on opportunities to develop new business models. And some companies are um, actually a bit worried about what those changes uh, will mean for their business going forward. So we're trying to give a bit of an educational perspective on what those changes are, what they mean for corporates, and how uh, corporates might be able to um, benefit from them. So. Um, We'll try to shed some light on open banking on the second payment services directive, uh, a bit of information on the new payments architecture, and we'll talk about some of those overlay services like request to pay and confirmation of payee. Um, if anyone is not aware, by the way, and Rory, please do jump in if I get this wrong, but um, if anyone's not heard of Pay UK, so Pay UK is now the uh, sort of governing body of UK, UK payments. Uh, they were formed after <clears throat> Bax, Faster Payments, and the Czech and Credit Clearing Company were all amalgamated into one body. I think they've only had this brand identity for less than a year. So if you're not aware of Pay UK, that's who they are. Uh, they do have a website, uh, We Are Pay UK. Um, so as I said, there's a number of common myths, and we'll aim to dispel some of them during today's session. Um, so rightfully, a lot of people are concerned that open banking, for example, might be a security risk. So um, open banking involves opening up your financial data and the ability to make payments to a third party. So a lot of corporates are worried about what the security impact of that might be. Uh, similarly, people are a bit scared that any payment systems, accounting systems, treasury management systems that they've invested tens or hundreds of thousands or millions of pounds in uh, are gonna become either obsolete or require very, very expensive changes when the UK payments uh, systems change. Um, request to pay, some people are scared that essentially this is um, a replacement for direct debit. Um, there is a bit of information going around from some of our uh, competitors who have been a bit naughty at the moment, talking fear-mongering about the future of BACs and saying that it's going to be eradicated and that people must change their systems now or be left in the lurch. Um, confirmation of payee as well. Um, people are concerned about whether that is um, a mandatory change or not, or whether it will even um, have a positive impact on reducing uh, levels of fraud. So those are the kind of questions we hope to answer today. So open banking, as I mentioned earlier, open banking is a regulatory uh, mandated initiative where uh, the nine major UK banks uh, will be forced to open up access to bank accounts and, and payment services to trusted third parties. Um, to that end, I guess, Adrian, um, can you give us a bit of an explanation on open banking? Let's assume, uh, let's assume I'm a corporate and I've never even heard of open banking. What would you, what would you tell me about that? Yeah, okay, no, thanks, uh, Danny. Um, so I think um, it's probably worth doing a little bit of scene setting and, and explaining, you know, kind of what it is as you, as you uh, asked for there, and then maybe looking at kind of how people are using open banking. Um, and then maybe then we'll get on to kind of trying to dispel the myth, as, uh, as it were. Um, so, uh, I mean, open banking, as you say, does allow um, regulated uh, third parties to do things that previously um, it was hard for them to do or maybe impossible for them to do. Um, and, and, you know, we probably expect there'll be a range of things that will, will evolve over time. But at, the, at this stage, um, open banking as a, as a sort of a security framework um, uh, and a set of APIs will allow regulated and trusted third parties to uh, access customers' uh, account information once they've been given obviously consent and permission to do that. Uh, and, that and we'll talk about how that could be used and also to um, initiate payments on behalf of a customer as well. Um, and, you know, and that came about uh, you know, uh, uh, driven very heavily by the uh, Competition and Markets Authority uh, and also kind of you know, you know, heavily coincidental with the um, uh, Payment Services Directive 2, which sort of uh, formalized, for want of a better word, these two new um, regulated sort of payments entities or uh, ecosystem entities, these uh, things called AISP, so Account Information Service Providers, and PISP, so that's Payment Initiation Service Providers. So they're new, they're new things. So um, effectively, you've got a set of standards, a set of APIs. 
you've got a secure framework by which uh, the you know the right kind of regulated organisation can on your behalf go and speak to your bank uh, in a common, secure, trusted way and say, would you mind giving me this information or would you mind making this payment? Um, and, and you know, and, and really that sort of covers um, all those sort of accounts that can be accessed online or by mobile. Uh, you know, and, and the key things would be sort of business and, and consumer uh, current accounts. So maybe if we go to the next. Uh, slide, we can have a little think about how then that's being um, being used. So before we kind of, um, you know, uh, that's right, we'll, we'll, we'll slowly unveil the, the, some of the exciting things that are happening here, um, and I'll take you through a few of those in a minute, but it's worth saying that there's a few hundred registered entities now um, with open banking. Um, the majority um, are um, account information service providers, so those people that will want to go and, um, with your permission, access your uh, bank account to get information, and we'll talk about how that might be used in a minute. Um, and it's kind of interesting to see that the progress seems to be fastest in the sort of SME, you know, small, medium-sized enterprise segment, uh, driven by some of the large accounting software packages, you know, the likes of Sage and so on. Um, but there are also some very interesting startups that are, you know, helping businesses have much better, clearer, simpler access to their to their kind of um, bank information, such as you know, Coconut, for example. They're another one. Um, you know, so you get things like notice that you've been paid, for example, which, you know, straight away uh, via, you know, I mean, the, the you know, user interfaces of these things are great. So that's a kind of, you know, high-level sweep. I mean, you've got things like product comparison and accounting, account switching, so that allows somebody to look at your, you know, current spending patterns um, uh, and bank account usage and compare that to what's out there from other providers and, and make suggestions. Um, You've got, um, if you go down on the sort of grey box, you've got alternatives to current account overdraft. So that's where, um, you know, the, 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 the a service would say, okay, we noticed that you're about to go overdrawn. We've worked out that under your current terms you would pay, you know, X for being overdrawn. Well, we as an organisation can lend you that money for Y, Y being less than X, um, so you don't have to pay the bank charges. Uh, you'll just pay a charge to us for the short-term loan of that money. So alternative forms of overdraft. Um, sort of funding, um, you know, uh, fi proactive financial management. So this idea that, say, that uh, uh, the application can look ahead and say, well, we can see that you're due to pay that standing order at this particular point in time. As it currently stands, you haven't got the money. Um, you know, you might want to move some money from one account to another to make sure you don't incur charges. Um, obviously, budgeting tools would be a natural uh, extension of that. Um, you know, uh, quite a lot of providers, people like Yolt have got this um, idea of, uh, of aggregating all of your different bank account information into one place so you can see sweep across. So if you've got an account with HSBC and some accounts with Lloyds and some accounts with Barclays or whoever, uh, you can see them all in one place and, you know, easily move move your money around in a, in a, in a, in a kind of fairly simple sort of way. Um, you know, initiating payments is, you know, becomes quite interesting. Um, you know, organisations such as Trustly can, you know, are, are involved in that place where it allows uh, merchants to, to use direct from bank um, payments rather than going through the card schemes. Uh, you know, figures. I mean, these are, these are these are highly kind of wet finger and ear figures. But you know, there is a figure that was given to me recently that the uh, UK retail sector spent around a billion pounds a year on card and card related fees. So. You know, maybe there's some opportunities for uh, payment initiation straight from bank account that might um, might have a place. Um, you know, recognising that, of course, you know there are many reasons why people use card payments um, above and beyond just making the payment. Um, you know, uh, things like speeding up loans and mortgage applications. So, you know, today in many cases you have to sort of fill in quite lengthy forms, giving your financial kind of history. Well, if you give your permission to a third party AISP. They can drag that information down for you, uh, provide it to the um, to the to the, to the um, you know maybe the mortgage company, uh, and they can get full access and, and they get a full view about things like affordability, uh, and you know and as it says here, find the account balance uh, before you make a payment, so you know before you pay that you've got the money. Very very simply, things like age verification are also kind of services that seem to be kind of appearing as well. So lots of really interesting kind of services. Appearing, these are, these are we, you know, this is a centre. This is just, um, you know, the, the tip of the iceberg, um, and that, uh, you know, there's every possibility that uh, a new and innovative services will be developed over time uh, uh, as as people get their heads around what open banking can, you know, possibly support. So that's a bit of a kind of a, 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 a sweep through. Um, 
if you go if you went on the open banking website by the way there's a whole list of all of the current registered uh, providers and you'll see the wealth of uh, services of, that, that, that they're supporting um, I suppose Danny you want me to kind of dispel the myth would that be would that be right about this sort of uh, security <laughs> I think so, Adrian, and thanks very much. That's a really, um, really all-encompassing kind of summary of what what some of the potential business models are um, under open banking. I, I view it as a kind of a, a two-track thing. So let's let me give you one example, Adrian. So say I was using an access pay cash management service. I'd set up um, the ability to receive my bank statements direct from my bank or over Swift or something like that in one of these older, more traditional methods. Um, how exactly would I open up access to my bank account um, as a corporate using the AISP service? So we were talking about security and whether there's a, a security risk here. So how does the consent and, and stuff work? Yeah, that's no, worth talking about that, isn't it, really? So, I mean, I, I think the, you know, the concerns are suddenly you've got lots of players out there who are, you know, potentially have you know, a very, very free access to people's kind of financial information and, and you know, even, even more material, I guess, being able to initiate payments. I mean, it's first, first saying, or first, it's worth saying that uh, you know these entities have to become regulated uh, and, and registered um, by the Financial Conduct Authority. So that takes a bit of more than a bit of effort. That's quite a quite a, a, an exercise in itself. So to become an AISP or PISP, you have to be uh, um, registered with the FCA. You also need to get registered on the open banking um, um, uh, implementation entity. It's called, but with with the open banking organisation. Uh, and that you know, there's a, there's a set of kind of um, in, in kind of fairly stringent uh, requirements to become part of that. Um, you, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a, all of the message management and all of that sort of uh, all of the way the standards work. It uses the absolutely most you know up to date kind of um, uh, secure uh, encryption um, techniques, secure credential management, and so on. Um, and you know, it, it, all the usage is monitored. Um, but, but, but importantly, you know, you as the customer have to give consent. So again, the banks won't do anything unless they are absolutely certain that you've given consent for this thing to happen. And the whole framework, the open banking framework, just you know supports all of that. So unless you give consent, uh, then 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 uh, obviously, but you know, just to reassure you, everybody, that then you know the banks will not um, give access to the information. So I think you know as much as possibly could ever be done to um, secure. Uh, the, the access to you know what is quite important information, or to or, or to secure and to authenticate the people that are initiating payments on your behalf, you know, is and has been done um, uh, you know, under the implementation framework. I hope that answers your question, Danny. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Adrian. So essentially, the way we envisage it working, and this is something we're playing around with, um, using something called the open banking sandbox at the moment. So it's like a, a test environment. So if a customer wanted to add consents for access pay to retrieve bank account or bank statement data, uh, what they would do is they would be redirected from one of our services um, to their relevant online banking channel, give that consent, which can be revoked at any time, and then be redirected back to, to our service to, to view their bank balances and in a nice or graphical format. Uh, that's a pretty slick journey, we think. Uh, for payments, it's a little bit different, though, isn't it, Adrian? There's this notion mm -hmm. of uh, secure customer authentication, which is going to affect a lot of merchants and, and payment service providers. Yeah, yeah. No, certainly. So, 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 secure customer authentication is coming in on the 14th of September this year. I think it's um, it has taken a number of uh, organisations a little bit by surprise, um, even though it's been sort of published for a while. However, you, you know, I think the other thing that has been noticed by people in the industry is that there's been quite a few clarifications sought um, uh, on secure customer authentication, and some of those have really only been issued over the last few weeks. So. There is a real sense that um, you know there's still a bit more work to be done to to get absolute clarity on how you know or what the implications and impacts of, of secure customer authentication would be. And for those who don't know what secure customer authentication is, it means that for certain types of payments, so I think you know, above 50 euros, and there's other there's other types of um, uh, kind of effectively exemptions, but within within reason, um, you know, new new first type initiated payments, then the, the customer will need to be authenticated. Typically by um, two-factor authentication, so you know you, we might know that as um, the customer being sent a text message, for example, with a uh, PIN code in it, that enters the PIN code into the system, and off you go. So that does add friction into the journey, um, obviously, and that's something that you know, say, a lot of merchants are having to get their heads around. 
but there are a number of exceptions, um, and we could probably do a whole um, separate session on uh, secure customer authentication uh, and and where and when it applies. But um, but but yes, that that's something that would still absolutely you know uh, apply in this case. So that doesn't go away. You know, payments will need to be or the the, the initiator of the payment will need to be authentic, you know authenticated uh, if it meets certain criteria. Does that help, Danny? Thanks. Thanks, Adrian. That, no, that's absolutely perfect. And obviously, uh, for anyone who's got any questions on um, open banking as we go, please use the uh, chat panel on the left there. I can see some questions coming in, which we'll get to at the end. Um, so th thanks, Adrian. So that secure customer authentication, I guess, is a, a, is a user um, using a second factor of authentication to sign or approve a payment. So they might uh, initiate the payment in a web browser, but they might use a, a, a mobile phone-based token to then give a second factor to approve that. So that's a user um, verifying that they want to make the payment. On the other side, um, we have this notion which is being introduced uh, this year called confirmation of payee. So confirmation of payee, Rory, that's not quite a user signing a uh, payment to give approval. It's more checking the beneficiary name or details that surround the account that's being paid to. That, that's right, Danny. It, it's essentially a name checking service. So when you would set up a, a new payment, either to um, another business or a customer paying a business, uh, they would um, put in their name, something that's taken already and lots of people that assume um, is checked, but it's, it's actually not. And uh, the system will look that name up against uh, the Open Banking database, um, and it will give back an answer. Yes, this is the correct name, so that's the right name for that account. Um, no, the name doesn't match, so you should really go and check the details. Um, no, but the name is a close match. Now, um, my name, uh, Rory, is um, maybe one that's uh, slightly more unusual, but perhaps someone had typed in Roy rather than Rory into the system. If someone mishears my, my Scottish accent, uh, and then maybe the system would say that name's a close match, but here's the actual name. Are, are you sure that's correct? And, and finally, it can say, oh, this, this isn't a, an account. We don't recognize these details, um, so it's unavailable. Thanks, Rory. So, um, as you can see on screen there, we've got uh, the number of sort of outcomes of a confirmation of payee check. So, we've got yes, the name and account type match. We've got no, they don't match, or we've got a close match or unavailable. So, Rory, what, what's driving this um, confirmation of payee uh, initiative? Who's driving it and what is it intended to combat? Well, it's one of a number of measures developed in something called the Payment Strategy Forum, which happened a couple of uh, years ago now, and it's handed, been handed down to Payout UK to deliver that on, on behalf of the payment systems regulator. Um, it's really to combat um, authorised push payment fraud, sometimes referred to as APP, um, and particularly something called impersonation. Now, how that typically would affect perhaps a lot of your users, or, um, or hopefully not, but a business, would uh, be something called CEO fraud. Um, uh, it's occasionally someone phones up perhaps pretending to be the CEO of one of your suppliers or their financial director, and they would say, oh, our account details have changed. Could you change them in their system, please? And a diligent member of staff might, might go and do just that, not completely unknowing to them, though. That's actually a fraudster. It's not, it's not the CEO at all. But, but since the name hasn't been checked, uh, there's, no way of, uh, there's no way of knowing that before the transaction goes through, and it can be really hard to recover that money. Um, it's not a silver bullet, so that sort of fraud, though, is responsible for around £150 million a year of this authorised push payment fraud. So it's a way to, to combat that. And there have been good experiences in places like the Netherlands, which has been really, really successful in cutting impersonation fraud. Thanks, Rory. That, that's great. So um, I think v version one, I mean, I guess to take a quick step back. So I, I work in payments. I'd like to think I know what I'm talking about. And my mind was absolutely blown when I found out that I could send my brother a tenner with the name Scooby-Doo on it, and none of the banks would be checking that because the infrastructure just doesn't exist for doing so. So 
as a retail user, as, as Danny, the man on the street, um, this service will be available to me through all online banking channels, and the same for any corporates that use online banking channels. Um, what about anyone that uses Back Software or Swift or another connection for making their payments, Rory? Will this be included in version one? No, so it's kind of a two-phased approach to introducing confirmation of payee. Um, version one, which is the version we've sort of been talking about uh, today, is part of phase one. And at the moment, the payment systems regulator are consulting on whether to make that mandatory for the big banks. And I know anecdotally that a lot of the smaller banks are planning to introduce it as well. And that's really to get that consumer angle where a lot of this uh, fraud happens. But Pay.UK is just starting another project uh, looking at phase two, and that's exploring other possible applications uh, for this service. It's not intended to be a mandatory service for things like corporates, but we want to explore how they can use it. One of the ones, that, the use cases that we often hear back from our, from our stakeholders is uh, corporates wanting to check, um, for example, who, who is paying them if a, well, a big gas company, for example, gets uh, um, perhaps thousands of, of bills a day, all with a gas, gas bill written on them, how do we reconcile that with our system? And maybe th then using confirmation of pay to actually check who, who is paying them could be something that's really useful in, in reducing uh, their, their billing costs. And there's all sorts of other potential applications for things like bulk and also for things like building society accounts which aren't uh, contained within phase one. So really we're at the beginning of a journey here and we're looking to explore that with people with an interest in using the system. Thanks, Rory. That, that's great. So I think, um, I guess my, my view was that absolutely uh, request to pay, uh, sorry, not request to pay, confirmation of payee. Um, will help to reduce authorised push payment fraud. I think that's, like you say, that's just one use case for, for payments out, and another is matching payments in. Um, it could also be used for things like direct debit, couldn't it? Yep, equally uh, direct debit, and that's, uh, it's, it's confirming particularly who that direct debit's from. Uh, there are, like, there's a variety of other um, applications uh, to, to bulk. And we, what we need to do now is we really need to drill down into what um, our users want from this service. And it, it's people like you, Danny, who I know have been involved in uh, the stage, but also uh, your customers. And it, it's exploring uh, the potential this, this has. Um, and what we don't want to, what we don't want to do is uh, create something that that people eventually aren't going to use or isn't going to be useful. So um, we're looking to hear from, we're looking to hear from you and inform that. Thanks, Rory. I guess just before we um, move on, we've just had a question come through, and we we might as well ask there. Uh, is confirmation of pay compulsory? I guess that would be a a two prong response from you, Rory. Is it compulsory for the banks, and is it compulsory for corporates? Yeah, quite, um, Danny. It, it, the, the short answer is it, it probably depends who you are. It, it's not compulsory in anyone yet, but it's expected following the current consultation that the PSR are running that the big banks are going to be uh, asked to install this by, by the end of this year. So what that means is for, all the, for most people on the line, I imagine, is when they're setting up a payment into a, a bank account, that they will, that confirmation Pay of pay check will be will be performed. It'll take that few extra seconds, so you are sure that the person you're paying is is correct. Um, for corporates, we would never envisage a, a mandatory service. We're uh, looking for it's it's really it's a choice. If you want to want to take the service on on board and you have a use case for it, that's what we want to explore with you. We don't foresee a situation where corporates uh, are forced, for example, to look up all their new customers uh, through the confirmation of PE system, but we recognize uh, that that might be something that they, they, they want to do. So uh, we, have to, we have to decide, uh, working, working with them, how, what would be most useful to them. Thanks, Rory. That's great. So we, we talked about how confirmation of pay will, um, you know, de definitely lead to a reduction in uh, authorised push payment fraud. It could be used for matching on bank statements. It could be used for direct debit as well. 
Uh, it could probably also be used for something called uh, request to pay, which we'll move on to next. Um, so request to pay was another uh, regulatory initiative, uh, uh, something called a, a, an overlay, which will sit over the future UK payments infrastructure. Uh, request to pay is another thing that was mandated by the Payment Strategy Forum. And from my point of view, one of the main detriments request to pay was seeking to address was um, that direct debit really wasn't seen as flexible enough for certain segments of the UK workforce. So obviously zero hour contracts, self-employment contractors are becoming a lot more prevalent at the moment. And direct debit wasn't seen as flexible enough to meet their needs for a flexible method of payment. Um, the uh, the view at the time was that you know people uh, didn't know what money they would have at which point in the month. So if people were given uh, foresight and advanced uh, notification that a bill was due, um, that they could respond to that request with a potentially a, a full payment early if they had the money there and then. They could respond to that request with a, a, a part payment. They could request an extension to pay that. Uh, they could send a message back to the requester, such as you know a gas bill or a telecom bill or something like that. Um, or they could block them or, or decline the request, indeed, if, uh, if they didn't agree they should be paying it. So, Rory, you mentioned earlier um, a use case for confirmation of pay around knowing who has paid you. Uh, surely something like request to pay would also address that, that detriment. Um, exactly that, uh, Danny. Um, I think you've touched on something really important there, and uh, this this came out of this drive to that you know a changing world really, with a world of zero hours contracts and perhaps where people don't have savings and could really struggle with um, with uh, unexpected bills. Um, but what it is, it's 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 a means towards a dialogue. It's a it's a system that allows. Um, Billers, whether they be um, someone like a utility company or all the way through to a charity speaking to its donors, for example, maybe a housing federation um, collecting rent, to um, discuss and really have a dialogue with their customers. And that just provides everyone with that just a, just a bit more control and clarity. Um, like I know, for example, you refer to direct debit there, and this, this isn't a replacement for it, direct debit, it's an alternative. But um, a, a business, uh, you know, when, when a direct debit fails, it costs both a, a business and a customer money. And uh, they, I think most businesses would far rather have a discussion with that customer. Uh, they would know, uh, for example, uh, who was paying them, when they were paying it, when that bill was coming in. And if that customer was struggling, they'd have a chance to have that conversation uh, rather than that direct debit lapse and then perhaps going into collections process uh, where they're chasing. So that's just one, uh, that's just one potential application. Um, there's also the fact that these are um, request to pay is expected to trigger account payments. Now we talked earlier about card costs. And I think uh, for businesses, this really begins to offer a, like a bit of an alternative to, to, to cards that, that, do, that do cost so much money. It's a, it's a triggering an interbank payment. Um, and, and finally, it it's just allows you to build over time those uh, relationships with those customers. That um, there are some customer relationships that are incredibly that are incredibly easy. Like for example, if someone has a direct debit, uh, they're paying every month on time, and uh, you don't you don't need to worry. But there are some customer relationships that are a lot a lot more difficult. And it's, yeah, it's really just a route to talking about how uh, we can make these better and also having visibility, say, if a customer can't pay that month, what is going to be there? What is going to be your cash flow? Can they pay when they get paid in the next few days? Or is that going to need to be a deeper uh, conversation about uh, your relationship going forward? Thanks, Rory. So we, we've got some examples there on the screen, and I, it was another thing that kind of blew my mind when I first found out. So uh, I was speaking to the group treasurer of a um, major uh, utility company, somebody, someone that everyone's heard of, uh, and she said to me that um, the cost of a failed direct debit was such that if a direct debit bounced, uh, this was for a gas company, if a direct debit bounced twice in a year, 
that brought that customer from being a profit-making customer to a loss-making customer. So fine were, were the margins. Um, what are some of the other benefits to, to corporates, Rory, on, on reconciliation and, and the cost of failed payments? Um, I think it really is that uh, that that foresight, um, Danny. So if that payment isn't going to be uh, reconciled in the usual way, uh, you should have some knowledge of when that's coming in because you can have that conversation um, with uh, with the customer. Um, the, the figure that blew my mind a wee, a wee bit was that 50% of utility customers, that they aren't actually on uh, direct debits. I, I, I was stunned, you know, because this is something that um, I, you know, I take personally, I take for granted. All my, all my utilities are on direct debits. Uh, and, and that touches on another issue. It's, it's a bit of a differentiator. It's a chance to, not, not everyone wants to pay that way. Uh, and it's a chance to offer something different to your customers uh, that you might previously have been uh, using really expensive methods for, say, for example, if they're paying uh, via, uh, via the high street or if uh, you're having to send uh, paper billing. Um, also, um, it comes, a request comes with certain amounts of, of information. So, say, you can attach something like an invoice to a request. And that can mean uh, you, it's a lot easier to process uh, those payments uh, through your system. So uh, the days for your utility company of thousands of payments a day labeled uh, gas bill or granddad's gas bill or um, power bill or all manner of different things that can be very, very hard to trace sometimes. Uh, it could be a thing of the past. Thanks, Rory. That, that's great. So I think, I guess, to, to summarise on requests to pay, um, you know, it's definitely not uh, coming to replace direct debit. It's definitely complementary to direct debit. Uh, you know, my, my view is that this uh, product, obviously, it's not mandatory. Not anyone, not everyone needs to offer this as a, as a business. But my view is that this kind of product is for, for a couple of use cases. Um, it's for customers who cannot pay by direct debit or, or, or do not trust direct debit. Um, a lot of people are a bit scared of having received a bank charge, for example, for going overdrawn. But I also think that requests to pay will lead to essentially some new business models, which we can't even comprehend at the moment because the technology is not, not even out there. But it is going to be launched in, in September. That is something that Access Pay are um, heavily involved in, in in the pilot scheme and, and working with the advisory group with, with Pay UK. So something that we're really, really excited about. Um, so anyone on the webinar who is interested in talking a bit more about what request to pay could mean for them, just let us know after the event and, and check out the um, check out the request to pay um, website. So we've talked about some of the new um, some of the new uh, payment services, overlay services. So we've talked about open banking, which is already launched. We've talked about confirmation of pay, which is next year. Request to pay, which is launching this year. Um, Adrian, back to uh, some of the older, more traditional uh, payment systems. Bax is, I think, over 50 years old now. Is it? Is it going to die? Is it going to be put out to pasture and, and retired? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, 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 I we. I think it would be great if it was if it was as simple as that, wouldn't it? You know, really. But um, no, that's. Uh, uh, the, the, I think we, you know, we, we'll, we'll certainly be able to um, kind of talk to that point. Um, it's probably worth though maybe setting the scene before we try and answer that question um, about what you know why that's come about and why people are thinking that might be the case. So um, the, it, the the thing that sort of triggered that thought is that there's a, a, a regulatory initiative again. Um, that uh, from this on the payment systems regulator that was getting concerned there wasn't enough competition in the market and enough innovation, not only in end user sort of payments products and services, but also uh, within the sort of ecosystem and infrastructure itself. So the same body that um, dealt with the detriment that uh, confirmation of pay and request to pay that uh, Rory has been speaking about, um, um, that the, the was set up to the payment strategy forum, an industry body. Um, that body was also involved in kind of looking at what might a new central payment system for the UK look like that might in time, and we'll come back to that in time bit in a minute, uh, replace uh, the existing payment systems we have in the forms of faster payments and backs um, and even some of the plumbing around um, the, 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 the check systems. Um, 
so you know that, that was it. The, the, this piece of work was done. If I was involved in the team that um, did this piece of work, um, and this this design here, this slide here shows the blueprint. It, it is a it is a blueprint. It's a kind of conceptual model. The challenge that um, yeah, has, has been then handed on um, by the regulator to Pay.UK is to turn that into a real thing that they can go off and procure. Uh, and I happen to know um, that they're you know in the middle of that process right now, and and that's going to be um, unfolding over. Uh, the next sort of few months or so. Um, yeah, timescales wise, um, you know, I mean, I mean, the reality is, is it'll be, I guess, at best about 2021 ish. This is my guess, not, I'm not speaking on behalf of pay.uk here, um, before, you know, the sort of system start to appear. Um, then there'll be some sort of industry testing, all those kind of things. And therefore, my, my best guess would be it's around 2023 ish, that's my best guess, before. Some of these things start to have a, a kind of you know more material impact on 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 the sort of the um, on the people perhaps you know are listening in on this uh, on this webinar. So, a um, couple of a couple of key points about <clears throat> the differences here. So, first thing is it, it's a, it's a layered architecture. Um, if we just go back one more, sorry, just a second. Um, <clears throat> it, it, it uses a, a, a kind of standardised interfaces. So, between the sort of the light blue and the grey, and between the grey and the green, I think called ISO 20022. Uh, the point about having a standard is that it makes interoperability much easier. It also, this particular standard, ISO 20022, offers things like enhanced data, which is, you know, kind of very interesting in terms of um, the sorts of services that, 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 that might be delivered off the back of that. You know, primarily, and one of the big uh, business case drivers for that was a much simpler um, kind of financial reconciliation. So rather than having an army of financial controllers all having to match up purchase orders and invoices and, you know, bank payments and all the rest of it, if you could carry a greater payload, data payload in the payment message itself, where perhaps you could have that information uh, somehow um, linked to it, not to say carry, but linked to it, that might make the uh, whole reconciliation process and management, financial management process is much simpler. And Rory, I think, um, sorry, Danny, I think you know, you're know you aware of, um, uh, of this already happening in, in certain parts of the world. Would that be right? Yes, Adrian, that, that's absolutely right. So I think we've just had a question as well around um, there's a grey section on there and on the screen it says, um, what does the box payment status and tracking mean? So I think they, they link pretty well. So um, we've just gone live with a couple of our customers um, in America. So America's long since been seen as a bit backwards as far as payment is concerned. They still use a lot of checks at the moment. Um, but this, uh, this messaging standard has been launched by some of the major banks over there in the last couple of years. And we've just gone live last year with with a couple of our customers. My mind was absolutely blown when I found out that um, essentially you could make a payment uh, to a third party vendor, for example, and along with that payment, you could reference multiple invoice numbers. So it's not just limited to 18 characters like that. You could reference an early payment discount. Um, you could reference a credit note that had been applied against that. And all wrapped up in that was a link to the original invoices, which was a link to an accounting package. Essentially, what that meant for corporates, I mean, that all sounds very fancy and shiny. What it meant for corporates is both the, uh, the payer and the recipient of the payment had a completely automated reconciliation process because rather than having um, staff peering through and, and kind of matching payments and things like that, they had some technology doing it. And what it meant for this particular organization was they could divert those resources to value-added uh, activities as opposed to sort of the manual monotony of, of, of reconciliation. Um, we've, we've had another question as well through Adrian. So um, does this mean BACs will be turned on when the new payments architecture, uh, does this mean BACs will be turned off when the new payments architecture goes live? So is it, is it a migration process? Is it a big bang? Yeah. So this is again. This is this is this would um, so based. It's a very good question. Um, so based on, on on the fact that you know, so Bax is obviously it's a scheme and it's a brand, and Bax offer. I'm sure you will know this, but they offer a, a kind of bunch of um, payment products, um, services such as direct debits and direct credits. So you know, for things like salaries. Now, the the ecosystem has built up over the last 50 plus years. You know, there are now uh, it's complex. So there's 100, over 150,000 organisations who are using, you know, who are kind of connected to the back system for those direct debits or direct credits. Uh, you know, there's 20 software providers, there's 50 um, facilities management companies, 
and there's, uh, there's 700 bureaus, so people that you know kind of facilitate the management between the, or the, the interfaces between uh, uh, organisations and the sort of the back system. So there's a lot of complexity in there, uh, and the idea that there would be a kind of big bang, it all gets switched off and get, and all of that complexity gets slipped over overnight, I, I think is is kind of highly unlikely. Um, if you want my best guess, and having kind of worked at uh, you know Pay.uk for, for for a fair old while. Um, you know, the, the, my, and, and works in the payments in that kind of payment space. My best guess is, is it's a bit like the kind of the digital TV analogy. So, you know, digital TV gets stood up um, and analog TV is still running. And eventually what happens is people go, actually, there's some really good features on that digital TV. Next time I buy a TV, I think I'm going to go and get myself a digital TV rather than go out and find an analog TV because I get more channels, I get more controls, I get more information and so on. And I think it's going to be a little bit like that with these bulk payment services. I think there will be people in the market who will offer some very interesting alternatives to the current direct debit and direct credit products. Um, and I, I think they will be, they may be interesting from an innovation, information, or even kind of a cost point of view. I mean, who, we'll have to see how that plays out, given the back is actually quite a, quite, a, quite a good, you know, value service already, given it, the way it works. Um, but ultimately, people will then be able to look at it and go, actually, the idea that when I do my bulk payments, I can get all that extra information carried through and I can use that to improve my, my, my payment processing and therefore costs and efficiencies, uh, my cash flow or whatever, people might then go, I'm going to, the next time I'm going to move across to, to this new bulk services. So I think it's more likely to be a bit like that than a big bang. In terms of you know, faster payments or the single immediate payments, there will, that will be more of a switch over, but that should be largely shielded, I believe, from, um, from you know, corporates and organizations largely. Um, as far as I as far as I can work it out, so I don't. If it was me, I wouldn't be panicking at this stage. Yeah. No, yeah. That, that's great. And um, apologies, uh, we're running a little bit running a little bit over. So I'm just going to kind of skip to skip to this final slide. So I think I'll try and summarise the five of these myths. But before um, I do so, uh, for anyone um, for anyone listening in, Adrian, Rory, I guess uh, Rory, if you want to go first, what what can a corporate organisation be doing uh, right now to sort of prepare or embrace some of these changes? What advice would you give to a corporate? Um, like from P.U.K.'s uh, point of view, um, I think it, it, the message is really get involved. Um, these, uh, and a lot of these processes, as Adrian just talked about there with the NPA, and we mentioned with the confirmation of PAs, uh, phase two uh, earlier, we're at, we're at the start of a journey, and we want to hear what corporates think. We want this to be a market that's user that's user driven and responsive to their needs. And there's all sorts of channels and ways you can get involved. That's a very simple first step is just to sign up for things like our events list and our newsletter. You can do that by emailing us um, and, and come along and, and, and participate and let us know what you have to say. And then uh, companies like yours, Danny, and others are, are taking those away and uh, want to shape these services uh, to your needs. So, so do come along and make your views heard. Thanks very much, Rory. And certainly, obviously, we're happy to have a have a conversation with anyone who's interested in any of this stuff. This is our this is our bread and butter. Um, just before we wrap up, then, Adrian, any any final words of advice for any corporates listening in on how they can prepare or embrace these uh, these changes? Yeah, I mean, I think practically, if I was in a in an organisation uh, right now, I think I would be. You know, practically organising a couple of days, a couple of days, a couple of hours, sort of a little brainstorming workshop based upon some of the things that you know we you hopefully you've heard and found interesting today, uh, to see what, what what might be able to be leveraged to kind of benefit your businesses. Um, some of that stuff is quite short term, so some of the stuff you can get on quite you know more immediately with some of the fintechs out there that can support that, and you know organisations obviously such as Access Pay that can help with that, uh, and um, you know also maybe taking a strategic view about you know, cost of payments and looking at where um, things like the new payments architecture might kind of come into play and what that might mean for your business, you know, maybe a bit further down the line. That's what I would do. Thanks so much, Adrian. Um, I just want to say, so we're, we're going we're gonna to wrap up now, uh, but thank you so much. We've got, had just over 200 people on the call today. Uh, there's loads of questions we didn't get time to answer. Um, that's probably my fault for talking too much, but we will try and contact uh, everyone in, individually to see if they had any further questions. But thanks again, and thanks so much to Adrian and Rory. Okay, so as, as Danny has mentioned, that's all the time we had for today's webinar. 
Uh, but once again, on behalf of our speakers, Danny, Rory and Adrian, and the Access Bay team, thank you very much for joining us and viewing our presentation. Uh, the follow-up email which will be sent out to you will contain the on-demand version of the uh, recording today, as well as some additional material. So please look out for that. And again, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, have a lovely day. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, all.